Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who have joined us today. Welcome to the webinar, Humanitarian Energy Decarbonization. And this is the third webinar in the series, Case Studies and Lessons Learned. My name is Ranja Basnit, and today I'll be your facilitator for this webinar. As you know, this webinar is organized jointly by Energypedia, ICRC, and GPA Global Platform for Action and is part of an ongoing webinar series where we are looking into decarbonization of energy infrastructure in displacement situations. So we already had our first webinar in September where we looked at how to integrate renewable energy solutions into humanitarian response planning, where we had presentations on the energy efficiency part of it, on climate part of it. And then we had another webinar in October where we dive deeper with some technical inputs looking at some tools that you can use for energy assessment and so on. So in case you have not had a chance to look at our previous webinar, I highly encourage you to have a look. All of our previous webinar are documented on Energypedia, the link to which is dropped right now in the chat. And uh, we will also, this webinar that you are having today will also be recorded and we will share the presentation as well as the recording with you in a follow-up email tomorrow afternoon. And um, could we go to next slide, please? So um, let's kickstart the webinar by, uh, uh, by knowing a few housekeeping rules. So today we will be taking in your questions. Um, on your screen on the right side, you have a box called questions. Please uh, type in your question and also uh, please, um, address, please mention to whom the question is addressed to. Today we have three presentations, so please do tell us to whom the question is addressed to. And then if you are using um, a mobile device, you will have a Q mark, so you can use that to um, send us your question. So a quick look at today's agenda. As I mentioned, we have three amazing presentations lined up for today, really bringing out the expertise and experiences from the field. So we'll kick start with a presentation from Urban A, where we will look at assessment on clean energy in cities in humanitarian contexts. So our presenter will also give us key points from her, from her study in Kenya, Lebanon, and Syria. Then we will move to GIZ Uganda, where our colleague will talk about using mini grid for electrifying health centers and distributed electricity to businesses and household. And then we will jump to Kenya, where our colleague from UNHCR Kenya will talk about site-wide plan for decarbonizing humanitarian energy infrastructure and social institutions. So with the agenda, now let's um, get to know you, the audience, a little bit. So we will have a poll question popping up in your screen. So uh, it should be popping. Yes, uh, it is there on your screen now. So please do tell us where are you tuning in today from? So are you tuning in from Asia, Africa, Europe, North America, or others? So we'll give it a few more, let's say 10 more seconds because the votes are coming in. And um, if you haven't voted, please do vote. And now we will close the poll and uh, display the results. So um, we have a lot of our audience tuning in today from Europe followed by North America, Af uh, sorry, North America, Asia, and Africa. Welcome to all of you one more time, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're logging today from. So let's have our second poll question on the screen. So do tell us in which sector do you work? Do you work in energy organization, humanitarian organization, private sector, research institute, so um, let's leave the poll for another 15 to 20 seconds. So maybe another 15 seconds. And if you haven't voted, please do vote. And now um, we will close the poll and display the results. So thank you. Thank you for all who have voted. So we have our majority of um, sorry, our attendees working in the humanitarian organization, followed by private sector, followed by energy organization, uh, research institute, and lastly, a huge chunk from others. So thank you so much. Um, now back to our webinar agenda. I am very happy to invite our first speaker for today. 
So our first speaker is Sina Begbai, who is the general manager and senior analyst at Urban E. She's an urban development professional specialized in urban analysis and planning with rapid urban growth, mitigation affected cities, urban poverty, and so on, and has more than 10 years of experience in the field. So Sina, we are going to now send you a request to share your screen. So if you could accept our request and share your screen, uh, we can begin with the presentation. Many thanks uh, and good morning and good afternoon to all the participants. Um, let's see if I manage to share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Yes, uh, if you could go in full screen mode, uh, we will then be only able to see your presentation. Sure. For some reason, I cannot do that. Um, uh, if not, we can also um, uh, continue in this format if you're having difficulties. Uh, it says that I'm not allowed to uh, share it in full screen. I'm not sure why. So let me just uh, um, share in this mode instead. Um, so my name is Cindy Bagby. Um, as was said, I'm the general manager of Urban A. Urban A is a consultancy based in Oslo, and we specialize in uh, in strategy development and, and analysis, especially on urban crisis settings. Um, Starting end of last year and, and continuing this year, uh, Urban A was, um, was asked by NordCup and RC um, to conduct a study to support acceleration of clean energy across the humanitarian development and peace sectors, uh, and in particular focus on complex environment and urban response settings. Um, the study that we conducted, it builds on the Empowering Africa's Most Vulnerable, a study conducted by Boston Consulting Group and NordCup jointly, uh, which investigated the deployment of clean energy solutions in Africa with a focus on rural and camp settings. So the, the reason why NordCup also was interested to, to have this second report was that NordCup uh, and ourselves included are increasingly involved in response in urban areas. As you all are aware, there is a rapid urbanization happening in the world. Um, migration and displacement is increasingly taking place in urban uh, contexts. And some of the largest displacement situation we have today is indeed to urban areas. And a growing share of humanitarian crisis, both man-made and natural disasters, are indeed also unfolding in cities. So that means that humanitarian actors, including Norka, are increasingly working in complex urban uh, environments. And within cities, pre-existing systems, governance structures and overlapping vulnerabilities also exist. And some of our work look in particular um, to this aspect of, of uh, responding in urban areas, uh, taking account of what systems are there from before and, and look at uh, the, the nexus in brief, but, but the, the recovery and, and the ground transitional phase from humanitarian support. When we do our studies on urban crisis and, and the impacts on urban crisis, we usually follow a, a three-tiered lens, which we also applied in this study. So we look at the national, uh, the political and regulatory environment. We look at the city level, uh, focusing on the systems, the value chains, as well as the governance structures. And we look at the neighborhood and household levels uh, where with the needs and vulnerabilities of both this place, but also host communities, migrants, etc., uh, as, as a focus area. For um, the clean energy, that means that we have been looking at um, the, the 
actors, the population, the density, the markets, the grids, the value of land and energy usage, uh, starting from the national level and down to the varying degree of access uh, to services and infrastructure, adequate housing and, and livelihoods at the neighborhood level. We looked at three case studies, Lebanon, Syria and Kenya. This is countries where we also have other uh, projects ongoing, including uh, uh, previous studies on the COVID impact in Nairobi in, in Kenya. And we also been involved in the development of analysis projects on uh, the impact of the Beirut blast, uh, as well as urban recovery framework uh, work in, in Lebanon and, and Syria. And the three case studies, uh, as mentioned, they follow the three tier lens where, where for Syria we looked mainly at the national level and Lebanon more at the city level and then Kenya more at the neighborhood level, including collecting data from two neighborhoods in Nairobi, um, Mukuru and Kumbani. So the, the share of renewable energy as, as uh, part of the energy mix is quite different in, in Kenya, Lebanon and Syria. As you will see in Kenya, it's 79% renewable energy, mainly from hydropower. In Lebanon and Syria, there is uh, more or less a full dependency on fossil fuels. In Kenya, uh, there is uh, 65,000 refugees in the country where estimated 15% live in Nairobi. Um, many of these refugees settle in, in neighborhoods uh, that can be characterized as slums or popular settlements um, and, and face higher challenges in, in access to services. In Kenya, one can say that electri electricity access in theory is 100%. Uh, however, as you will see from the data from these two neighborhoods, um, the reliability and quality varies and the provision in the two neighborhoods is, um, uh, has both variations and also a, a different composition of, of, of the type of access to energy uh, residents can uh, uh, use. Um, more than eight out of ten households in Kenya rely on firewood and charcoal for cooking every day. In the neighborhood studied, um, there is a mix of, of energy use also here, but, but a high reliance on uh, firewood and charcoal as well as gas for cooking. Lebanon and, and Syria is quite similar in, in several aspects on this. There is a high reliance on fossil fuels. There is an energy crisis ongoing in both of the countries, and there is also a fuel crisis ongoing in both of the two countries. There is, as you will know, um, an estimated 1.5 or 1.7 Syrian and Palestinian uh, refugees in Lebanon where 23% is estimated to live in Beirut. Lebanon has uh, uh, the highest refugee per capita uh, presence in the world and the uh, overwhelming majority resides in urban areas following the settlement patterns of um, the host population. When it comes to, to energy, there is a uh, ill-functioning uh, energy provision system in Lebanon, uh, which has only increased after the blast of 2020, uh, where also the electricity, the Liban, the state uh, electricity company was hit particularly by the blast. So from uh, around 21 hours to four hours, uh, access to energy and electricity uh, prior to the blast and with higher access in Beirut. Um, recently, now in October, it was down to one hour uh, in the capital. So in theory, uh, at least uh, a couple of years ago in Lebanon, people had access to clean cooking. Uh, however, 
there is a, a dramatic shift in this, including uh, deforestation to get firewood uh, for cooking and heating, uh, and also uh, an overall crisis where, where the, the industries and the small and medium-sized businesses are suffering greatly from the access from the lack of access to energy as well as the lack of access to, to fuel currently. In Syria, there has been, prior to the crisis, an attempt to, to initiate policies uh, to prompt uh, clean energy access. Um, however, this has, of course, been installed moment during the crisis but recently with the fuel crisis and with the energy crisis there is indeed also a growing trend of more solar panels uh, applied at the household level or at building levels so also in syria um, the access rate of electricity per day varies between uh, typically three to four hours per day um, but this is also impacted, as I said, by the current uh, fuel crisis. Um, coming back to the energy access in Mukura and Pumbani in, in Nairobi, Kenya. So 61% of our respondents had uh, formal connections to electricity networks. 39 had not. And as you will see when we break this up, Amongst the uh, informal um, connected electricity households, um, there was also variations on the type of agreements, either through their landlord or um, pre or post paid meters uh, or informal connections uh, through an agent. Of the formal connections, um, uh, Homes, uh, households negotiated electricity bills with landlords or um, had formally connected homes uh, paid landlord for a fixed price uh, or had a prepaid meter. And just 45% were not connected to the power grid all in Mokuru. There's quite a big difference between these two neighborhoods where, where uh, Mokuru is a newer settlement and, and definitely has a, a larger uh, challenges when it comes to access to services. And also in Wakura, there has been several uh, fires, mainly due to uh, gas cylinders being broken, one of them leading to quite a number of uh, deaths uh, some years back. Uh, which was also impacted by the pollution in the river um, and, and very dense uh, building structures. Pumbani is an older settlement um, with <clears throat> more formalized tenure agreements uh, and also more uh, house owners uh, in the neighborhood. However, in, in Pumbani, there is also a large market um, uh, next to the, the more residential area of the neighborhood. Um, and the, the price and the, the usage of the, the respondents was quite linked to also their ability to use this to support their livelihoods. Um, so you will see that the, the far majority used the energy consumption uh, at the workplace for lighting. Um, and to some smaller degree to charging the devices uh, and food um, and just seven percent did not use energy for their work um, but there were uh, kind of an, an impact of not having sufficient access to energy the percentage of, of those using solar power, power was quite low, as you will see, 16%. But the interesting finding also that only 25% of the respondents had heard about uh, solar solutions. In Beirut, uh, this is um, very much the same pattern. There is very uh, great variations on the energy access in different neighborhoods. 
Um, so you will see on the, on the graph to the left, these are different neighborhoods and their access to the public electricity grid. So that means that uh, in, in the absence of uh, public electric, electricity grid connections, people are using uh, either generators on, uh, based in the buildings or they use what they call community generators, which is operated by, by some people that's normally referred to as the generator mafia. Um, and only a, a, a small percentage would have access to renewable energy solutions. The access to energy also um, greatly impacts um, the protection and the safety in the streets. Many of these neighborhoods are very dense and, and in Lebanon we are talking about a much more vertical informal settlements, meaning that you have buildings of five, six stories high, height, where there is basically very little access to daylight even. Uh, so the lack of electricity has great impact on families residing here. <laughs> me. So our study um, in brief uh, can be summarized with 22 challenges for acceleration of energy, clean energy solutions in complex urban environments. At the neighborhood level, uh, for access and usage, poor and inadequate electricity access across cities, inefficient energy use in residential buildings due to the um, uh, construction material and lack of maintenance are some of the key features. The consequences of not having access to reliable energy can be summarized with unsafe um, unsafe streets, as mentioned, less opportunity to study, reduced productivity and economic acti activities, reduced food security, and more time allocated for drudgery. Excuse me. Um, impediments to successful introduction of new energy solutions. Low uptake of new technologies, increase in demand for electricity, and solar solutions require high upfront investments, while financing options are limited and invest investment risks high. Excuse me, it's a typical Norwegian cold in the, in the uh, start of the winter. At the uh, challenges <coughs> at the city level, uh, as mentioned before, we're looking at the systems level and in particular looking at <coughs> the larger impacts of recovery efforts at the systems and aiming to um, also uh, have recovery of the economic sectors as part of, of response. So first, there is a lack of, of knowledge and data uh, amongst city governance and also the management transmission and distribution networks <coughs> are poorly poor quality and overloaded there's a life a low lifespan and poor after <coughs> after life management for solar solutions and issues pertaining to land governance is also relevant in cities there is disputes over land rights, precarious tenure and threat to re redevelopment of informal areas, which might impact the type of <coughs> solutions that are possible to test in these situations. As mentioned, there is, uh, there is a number of parallel systems for energy provision and, and that um, challenges the, the opportunities to advance from pilot to scale. And um, <coughs> of course, the, the lack of energy has implications for other services. Tina, we are running closer to the time. So if you could uh, sum up in the next few minutes. 
Yes, one minute. Yes, so then at the national level, uh, there are of course challenges when it comes to the to the policy and, and regulatory frameworks. But as I said, there are some opportunities and, and some windows here as well. There is complex decision making and power structures, and markets not the markets not economically viable uh, for private providers, as well as energy sources as a root cause and driver of crisis. And um, here, of course, also the red lines of uh, international actors of whether or not it's possible to to work with the national bodies also impact uh, opportunities. So what are the approaches then to clean energy provision? So from our study, we've drawn 20 considerations and principles to guide interventions. At the neighborhood level, um, as, as some of the study uh, points to, to have granular data um, that can inform uh, evidence of contextual understanding is key. And this is important also to involve local stakeholders. And then to embed energy projects and accountability at the local level, and of course have a people-centered and community-led initiatives, and especially uh, uh, consideration for do no harm uh, and potential implications on other uh, safety measures. Um, we have discussed quite a bit potentials for piloting at the local level, including uh, neighborhood level interventions. And for that, finding an anchor client to solar PV systems is important. And then uh, consider providing additional energy through solar panels standalone and mini grids uh, to supplement public grid electricity. As mentioned, there is this uh, generator ma mafia in, in Lebanon, and one can think of options for almost transitioning from the generators to uh, mini grids to provide uh, additional services. Uh, and then, uh, furthermore, there is also options to explore potential mobile renewable sources um, and use the uh, um, ele electricity access as a leverage to address other challenges, uh, such as precarious tenure, linked to the provision of other services, and then uh, identify and seek to mitigate cultural barriers to implement clean energy solutions. Uh, as well as uh, improve and streamline, streamline assessments to capture the impact. At the systems level, um, for us, this links very much to also investigating, uh, as I said, options for increasing uh, the performance of other services, um, as well as the performance of local economy. Often when we look at urban crisis settings, um, it's somehow very uh, targeted towards the beneficiary level uh, and, and kind of the neighborhood or community scale. However, in an urban crisis setting, if you look at Beirut as an example, it's very hard to see ways that Beirut can recover from the crisis, if not the systemic uh, uh, lack of access to, for instance, energy. Uh, in the productive sector is also addressed. So our systems level recommendations uh, and principles really talk to that. Um, and then at the national level, as you will see, uh, it's, uh, our recommendations pertain to the policy level um, and also the financing of, of uh, potential clean energy solutions. And as I mentioned, in these countries, there are also uh, um, pilots and, and examples to build on, uh, but it's something about scaling this up and having a humanitarian sector that is ready to, to support such scale up. So that was it for me, and I apologize again for, for
medical research uh, a lot, but uh, I hope this was useful and looking forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheena. So now we'll go back to our screen. And uh, with that, uh, we now move to our second presentation for the day. And I would like to welcome Bettina Besh Simwaka, who is the head of Component Refusee for GIZ Uganda. And she manages two projects on energy access with focus on refugees and host communities. So Bettina, the floor is yours. Uh, we are going to send you a request to share your screen. And if you could accept that, and yeah, we can begin the presentation then. Yes, thank you very much, Ranisha, and also good morning and good afternoon, good evening to the participants. I am going into the PowerPoint mode. Yes, so my name is Bettina Besch-Semwaka, as Ranisha has already pointed out. I'm part of a team, energy team at GIZ in Uganda that focuses on renewable energy and energy efficiency. And the team that I'm heading is focusing specifically on refugees and host communities. We are working on two projects, as was mentioned. One of the names uh, is Energizing Development, in brief ENDEF, and the second one is Energy Solutions for Displacement Settings. And uh, while these two programs with ENDEF having a refugee component that I'm working on with the team, uh, are um, similar to a certain extent, they have some differences. I will only say that our, uh, that the similarity for instance is that we're working on sustainable market-based energy access for households, for social institutions and micro, small and medium-sized size enterprises. That's where there is a similarity and why two of these projects actually also funded the electrification of health centers in two refugee settlements in West Nile region in Uganda. Um, I've chosen this picture because I wanted you to take note what I mean when we say we did some electrification of health centers. This is actually one of the six health centers that we actually started working in. This is a um, aerial shot taken before we actually started our work and um, we had you can see I hope my cursor is now coming here this is the maternity ward as I already had a small solar system I think this is the inpatient ward um, where they also had a solar panels already you see here some here some even I think on one of the roofs over there was also solar. So we have um, actually access to power through partially through solar as well as actually diesel generators. So we are not saying that when we came we started at zero but actually had to look into what is still functioning and how can we support UNHCR uh, the government and the implementing partners to make this uh, sufficient electricity for these health centers. So kindly keep this in mind. When we um, were thinking about why would we do electrification of health centers, first of all, we also said, okay, there, um, there we need to present a case study. Um, how electricity will actually make changes within the health service delivery. And uh, we looked also into the theory of change of energy results chain framework for health services that was developed by uh, WHO in 2014. And um, it talks basically about when you give uh, access to energy how on the output levels and then outcome levels up to impact level you will uh, actually see changes because the medical staff will finally be able to provide uh, services that they can otherwise not provide uh, well. So as that is also in our um, concept in our logical framework in thinking, for instance, in ENDEF, that electrici electricity is in fact an enabler to provide improved health services in displacement settings. And we wanted to show that if it's well done, 
and uh, if um, sustainability aspects are also considered, it will uh, come a long way. So when we uh, started what do we want to focus on? We definitely said we will be checking on uh, usage of equipment and uh, the light for services. We would want to um, work towards staff safety. That would include even uh, staff retention. We knew that ideally this would help in uh, better communication. Um, while this will be harder for us to show, <laughs> we were also hoping and thinking that there will be elements of disease treatment and prevention. And then in this particular season that we find ourselves in, we also wanted very specifically look at uh, giving support to the COVID-19 response and prevention. This is uh, maybe just to the later point. Um, this is important because the, uh, these health centers, or these health units that we were going to work in had also been, um, they have been having isolation wards. And so we wanted to be sure that even tent-like structures would also get uh, access to energy in the way it is needed. If you heard me say that the two projects that we're actually working on have an element of market-based energy access. Um, I want to also say that indeed we chose not to do an, an results-based financing or a grant or whatever. We actually decided to pay for the in solar installation and uh, wiring and then also an element of operations and maintenance for about two years. Um, so there, at this part, there is no market-based access because we saw that uh, already the response, the refugee response within the Ugandan context is underfunded and we felt it was more important that uh, actually we could also showcase how it would work. Um, we knew that we wanted to uh, have elements in there like load limiters and remote monitoring tool that would later also help in, um, yeah, first of all, to, to have access to the energy needs that are planned for and then also to monitor how much of the energy we're actually using to take management decisions. We asked the health centers that we chose to work in to make minor contributions. So for instance, especially those health centers um, that have um, permanent infrastructure were asked to make sure that uh, the safety aspects would be, related, uh, would be uh, brought in from their side. For instance, we saw that there's a room where maybe the batteries and inverters could be stored but uh, the doors were not functioning very well. And so those were the contributions by the health centers. And then we also thought in this context of Uganda, where we were not able to do a systems approach in relation to operation and maintenance, we then decided that we would plan for energy access um, to have health unit management committees run an income generating activity. I will talk about that in a little while. So here you see a brief overview of the six health centers that were later chosen for the intervention. Just uh, so I, as I said, there were two refugee settlements. As you can see in these columns here, there is data on how many refugees and host communities uh, uh, were available in the catchment area and so we have in the catchment population approximately, I mean this is the lowest figure, uh, close to 17,000 people and the highest figure here in Ofua is about 31,000 people that are getting these services. Um, just also for interest, these, uh, if it, in Uganda system, uh, a health center too would be at parish level and should only serve a few thousand. And the health center three is at sub-county level and would be ideally serving 
10,000 people only. So we are way above in the refugee response and that also means we had to do a bit of extra uh, looking into which appliances are in these health centers, which future appliances could be there so that the services are adequately uh, provided. Then you see here in terms of the size of the system, it ranges basically from 2.8 picolowatt to 6.6. .6. And basically therefore those are, we consider them being um, standalone systems. Lastly, uh, five of these health centers were um, already about 20 years plus, up to 30 years in existence. So they're regular health centers. And one of them was specifically created because of the refugee response needs. And uh, therefore, the Ministry of Health is less involved and the management is with the um, implementing partner of UNHCR. So which projects process steps did we do for this electrification? We started um, last year actually with a workshop on energy access for health centers. We um, had invited the in charges of seven health centers, uh, the district local government, uh, specifically here the district health office and representative of UNHCR, um, talked about their observations in relation to their uh, energy needs and uh, challenges and they also considered and developed a few suggestions on solutions. Then uh, this was followed already in our first lockdown phase with rapid assessments of uh, two or by two technical staff of GIZ. They went to all seven health centers to analyze the status uh, in terms of their energy, their current energy uh, access, the systems that they had in place, uh, functionality of these systems, and um, all this was then leading to the selection of the health centers for the intervention. We assessed seven, in the end we chose only six, and uh, this was in relation because one of the health centers seemed in comparison fairly well off. These, um, so they had several smaller solar systems um, in place, and so um, it, in the end it was a decision made that this particular health center would not uh, get a standalone system here. The team of our technical teams went then ahead to do some of the sizing, uh, suggested sizings. They had also asked again also on current needs and potential future needs, which type of programming would uh, UNHCR and IP carry out. And uh, then it was also brought back to UNHCR and the IP to also reflect on what the plans were to, for their input. Then we went into the tendering process and in the meantime, we also had a baseline assessment done by an independent consultant, a public health specialist. And uh, then basically we had another uh, feedback loop again from the health centers, so though all the power sources were considered they um, and, and captured well the functionality, also asked the staff how many hours does actually the system work. And so we had another loop on the technical sizing and could make a few adjustments. Um, we This was also including some key informant interviews so that we would capture uh, the status at the time before this, the bigger solar system would come in. And yeah, then we actually had the solar systems installed and currently we are uh, working with health unit management committees. Those are the management teams uh, overseeing these health units in preparation of an operation and maintenance pilot. So here you see a few pictures on the technical assessment. You can also see why we indeed also chose the wiring to be part of the uh, system. We had 
few cases where we were able to include an existing solar system, um, which uh, some of you might be very well aware that it's not always recommendable. We um, Um, yeah, then as I, uh, as I hinted, we were already calculating uh, based on the ideas that were shared by the health unit management teams, uh, what type of income generating activity they might run and what uh, little energy needs they might also have for this uh, operation and maintenance. Here you see just an example on how we really went ahead to go um, to, to see which uh, equipment was already existing and then also potentially how it's planned for, how much uh, hours uh, were needed in day and night, and so then calculations were made. It's going to be interesting to also see whether actually <laughs> this was done properly. Uh, watching this now a few months into the systems now uh, running. And so we had, this is a much longer list where we went from each uh, ward in, in person uh, department and outpatients, ETC, maternal ward. And even staff houses uh, were considered. Then uh, just to say one of the challenges and considerations that we ha had was, um, yeah, um, the, the solar systems, as I mentioned, can they be included? What about the diesel gen set? So in one, um, in one health center, then the decision was taken that we would have a hybrid system because of a certain uh, place where they sometimes needed to run an AC and we didn't want to put that on the solar. So all these, um, basically in every health center, those individual needs were considered. Then we also saw that in the, U, in the refugee context, we had uh, a dynamic environment with many partners. And so no matter when our team went on the ground, supply and demand kept changing. So we had actually, while we were preparing for tender, we made uh, sizing adjustments. We had to do it while the contractor was already working on it and make a contract amendment. Uh, because also of these very dynamic changes on the ground. And I think this is not something new and just always one has to go with an open mind that these things will happen in the refugee response. Then, as I indicated earlier, we also chose, and here's a snapshot of what you can then basically read. We said, yes, we would like to do a remote monitoring. Uh, so we see, uh, is the system up and running? And then what we also realized, we have sometimes network failures. So uh, it's another level again, that um, while we try to do the monitoring and would love to use it also for management considerations, how much are we actually using in, um, of, the, of the energy that we are providing through the system and maybe how many more additional appliances could be brought to the health center to extend the services. And then just also to see um, the challenge that the network can indeed be then giving us false alarm in the sense that uh, they were thinking the system was already broken. But as of today and as I speak, we only know that actually currently power is provided 24 seven. Now with regards to the operation and maintenance. So as I indicated, we looked into how we could be doing this uh, also as a health system approach, but this was not very um, easy for us to do this uh, in these projects that last a little, uh, only a few multiple years. So we, the ideas from the health centers themselves was to do an income generating activity, which is maybe not so surprising, but it is important to note that the health centers in Uganda, especially the government ones, would not have the permission to run income generating activities. However, their budget for operational maintenance is very little, and so it is impossible for them to do um, 
proper planning for operation and maintenance. Um, even plans were usually not in, uh, at, given in any of these health facilities. It was a bit of an ad hoc thing. So now with permission by the sub-county government, we were able to actually uh, agree that this will be possible. So it's a bylaw by the sub-counties council. And important is also that we do not want to only do the system that GIZ brought, which is probably the, the biggest and sometimes the only, but uh, we had left a few of the very solid and functional ones also running, especially when it was uh, well done and a bit far off, uh, very suitable for one of the buildings. The question that we are currently trying to figure out, because we need to also see, this is ideally here a market-based approach. These people make an income to also then replenish their operation and maintenance, but is it a smart business model? Uh, the point is that um, we are already planning for a little bit of excess energy. So this is a cost within the system, plus um, that we are also supporting the, uh, these health unit management teams to actually get the income generating activity started. That's another cost and therefore we are wondering and have to now just before tender goes out um, to see whether it actually over time is still a valid model. Having said this, because we are very closely working with UNHCR in Uganda, um, they have also, the UNHCR in as form of their clean energy challenge also has the plan to do further electrification of community facilities, what we call the social institutions. And in a recent discussion uh, with headquarter UNHCR and um, Ugandan team, we are at least considering that maybe Uganda might be a good pilot country. And that would not only mean that the basis of this looking at what is needed by the whole health, uh, health center is being considered as a, a good practice and uh, then the technical sizing of the whole facility, but also to say what is the overall operation and maintenance approach. So for instance, there could be a consideration that operation and maintenance will be given to one contractor for the whole uh, solar systems that are existing. So those would be in WASH, in schools, in health centers, and uh, possibly other places, uh, reception centers. And then that would be a better answer probably. And then there could be maybe a setup that when whoever as a, in, a operational or implementing partner is interested in supporting uh, access to energy electrification would also have to contribute to the bigger operation and maintenance plan. Yeah, so this is only, this is my last slide by the way, this is only just a very brief overview how here in the middle is the health center, they are managed by a health unit management committee that doesn't meet very, very often. We have the district sub-county local government that should also be um, guiding the health unit management committee. Here is now this idea to do an income generating activity. The bank account would be needed. All these need special considerations and permissions. In the end, customers would likely be refugees, host community members and development and humanitarian staff. And here again is also still the solar service provider that has uh, provided electricity. Yeah, I think I leave it here. My time is also, I think, coming up. I want to say thank you and um, yeah, then hand over back to Ranisha. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bettina, for such a comprehensive presentation. Uh, we are just switching back to our screen. Um, a quick note to our audience. We are taking your questions, so please use the question box on your right side of your screen and just type in your question and send it to us so that we can address it to the speakers 
during the Q&A round. So moving forward, I would like to invite our final presenter for today, Mustafa Al-Momani, who is a UNHCR Energy and Environmental Specialist based in Kakuma sub-office Kenya. So Mustafa, the floor is yours. My colleague is going to now send you a request to share your screen. Well, thank you and uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all the uh, attendants of, uh, of this event. My name is Mustafa al -Mawari. I'm the UNSCR uh, CACOM as Office Energy and Environment Specialist in Kenya. And um, during this brief presentation, I'll try to show you some of the uh, updates and progress that we've made in Kakuma refugee camp at the Kalobe settlement uh, in regards to the uh, greening initiatives and uh, uh, the solarization activities. Um, um, as you might know, Kakuma is uh, one of the largest refugee camps uh, in, uh, in the world. And the population of, uh, of the camp is more than uh, 200,000 refugees. It's actually around 220,000 refugees based on the latest statistics. And uh, um, the, the, the camp in terms of uh, even not only population, but also area is, is a significant uh, uh, in, in terms of sizing. Therefore, we have to look at the energy uh, area as a cross-sectoral intervention, same as anywhere else, uh, whenever we address the energy uh, uh, interventions. Um, so in Kakuma, we've classified the energy priority areas based on eight areas, starting from energy for cooking, where we plan a gradual transition to cleaner energy solutions as a medium term plan between uh, uh, starting 2021, ending at 2025. Um, and it will be an action plan actually with uh, uh, the adaptation of um, an E um, diversity approach, product diversity approach, we call the four plus one that allows us to introduce different energy uh, products for cooking purposes. Then we, we have the energy for health priority area with a target to achieve 100% green electrification for health facilities by end of 2022. And energy for education with another target to achieve 100% green electrification for all education facilities by mid 2022. Energy for water is a very important sector that goes along with all the energy interventions and our plan and target is to achieve the borehole solarization uh, uh, target, which is the 100% by mid 2023, when if, if of course, and whenever we say 100%, this is subject to uh, financial feasibility and technical viability. Also energy for protection, for protection and security by setting up sand and own renewable energy systems for street and security lighting. The greening the operation is another priority area where we're targeting the solarization and shifting from diesel generators to renewable energy resor uh, resources, mainly the solar uh, systems and the UNCR compounds and the field facilities. And I will uh, share more details about this area. In addition to camp electrification and energy for productive use, which requires um, a comprehensive engagement of, uh, of the development agencies, the operation partners, the implementation partners, and of course the private sector uh, players to allow us achieve the CAP electrification and energy for productive use uh, plans. Um, I will, uh, of course, we don't have the time or uh, 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 to discuss actually the, all the priority areas. Therefore, we will give more details about energy for health, energy for education, and greening the operation with some inputs on energy for protection and security. Um, the, um, this, this is slide show you the, the, the CACOM refugee camp. And uh, 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 to the Western side, you can see um, a small part of the Kalubaye settlement, Kalubaye refugee settlement. And as I mentioned, the population and both refugee camp and the, uh, uh, and the refugee settlement is around 220,000 refugees. Um, the pens and the uh, icons that, that you can see in the screen are either 
secondary primary boarding schools. They could be uh, field posts, USCR field posts at reception centers or health facilities and other so uh, social also uh, uh, society facilities. This is the main road that uh, uh, passes just uh, by Kakum refugee camp and Kakum town, the house community. And also here, just to give a better indication on the size of the camp, this is the main road and to the furthest point from the main road, uh, um, the, the distance is 7.4 kilometer. Um, 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 I put this slide here just to show you how, it, how challenging, challenging it is to develop the uh, standalone solar systems and also study different options between uh, developing uh, uh, a mini grid or an electrical grid, given the fact that the refugee camp and the host community in Kakuma and Kalubei are completely off the national grid. So the standalone systems or uh, uh, developing uh, uh, mini grids is one of the main and only solutions available in, in that area. Um, in the project development uh, uh, stage for all the projects that uh, uh, we have considered for CACOM, either the ones under implementation or the one that we've tendered, uh, uh, of course, we followed the best practices in energy conservation and energy efficiency. And this has been applied to a total of 31 schools, seven health facilities, and six UNHCR field facilities. In addition to, uh, I would say, a mega scale or uh, a big, uh, I mean, uh, smaller than a mega scale project, which is the USR compound solarization. Um, and we expect the size to be 900 kilowatt peak with storage. And it, uh, 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 and it will be a hybrid system with a 20% diesel uh, generation. Uh, so our target for the UNSCR compound is 80% solarization, but for the other facilities is 100% solarization when possible, where the, um, um, the diesel generators will remain at the facilities, mainly the health facilities, in order to uh, support in case of emergencies and also for backup uh, solutions. All these projects for the, the facility that, uh, that I mentioned, they have already uh, uh, been developed. Some of them are under construction, others will start the construction very soon. And um, they are based or developed based on EPC contract where the private sector company will sign an agreement with UNSCR for engineering uh, procurement and construction for testing and commissioning in addition to uh, two years operation and maintenance uh, service. Um, only one project, which is the UNCR compound solarization, it was developed based on a lease agreement where an independent power producer will sign the agreement with UNCR once the project is, uh, is awarded. Um, so all these projects, as I mentioned, are under implementation or will start, we will start the implementation uh, early next year. The transition process had, of course, to follow the energy conservation and energy efficiency uh, measures. And we started with uh, behavioral uh, change activities and campaigns at either the education facilities, health facilities, and for the UNSR staff members. And then we started to replace the uh, energy hungry uh, consumption units, mainly the ACs, whenever possible, or uh, um, the uh, inefficient lighting units uh, also were replaced or scheduled to be replaced soon. So we do have an energy efficiency a plan for all facilities under implementation or has already been implemented. So of course, this would allow us to minimize the size of the solar system, given the fact that the solar systems for standalone applications or uh, rural applications, uh, which requires storage in our case, they are more expensive than grid connected solar systems. Therefore, with the uh, with uh, following the energy conservation and energy efficiency measures will allow us to reduce the sizes for the solar systems. Hence, the cost of the uh, of the infrastructure, the energy infrastructure. Um, for all the facilities, we've carried out energy auditing activities, and as you can see to the left corner. Um, this is uh, an inventory sheet with all the technical detail that has been collected at the auditing stage for 
a clinic and this one is mainly for the AC units available at this facility and it has all the details of, uh, of the electrical components. Uh, the type of the AC system, the manufacturer, the model, all the technical details are, are available, which of course has influenced our designs and sizing for the solar systems at such facilities. And then for the facilities that, that already have uh, uh, access to electricity, we had to do for the load profiling, which is another uh, um, practice to measure the current consumption or to understand even the consumption behavior, as you can see in this, uh, 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 in this screenshot here. Um, so energy auditing and load profiling were one of the main activities that uh, we've, we've carried out. Not only this, after, after we've finished, of course, the sizing and the, the auditing, the applying of the energy efficiency, we had to do the design in a, a, a or, or to come up with a final design for all these systems. And uh, uh, as you can see also on the screen, we've done the single line diagrams for the uh, around 47 facilities plus. And also we noticed an issue at most of the facilities that the distribution networks are either uh, um, constructed with improper um, uh, concentrations and uh, poor, I'd say, engineering um, uh, specifications and uh, uh, considerations as well. Uh, so we had to do also, or we had to assess the current health state of all the distribution uh, uh, networks at all these facilities. And we've also considered the upgrade requirements. We look at it as the backbone of the facility, of course, for such, for, for such applications. And as long as the distribution network is, uh, uh, is healthy, uh, well balanced and uh, technically uh, also strong, then of course this will uh, lower the technical stress on the solar PV uh, system once available in, in the field. At the same time, we've considered for all the facilities that I've mentioned, um, lighting solutions. And it's worth mentioning that uh, Kakuma again is completely off the national grid. And at the same time, there is no security lights at the, at the neighborhoods or even at the main streets. So this is also another protection area that requires enhancement and a security area that requires enhancement. Therefore, we considered um, a grid connected uh, lighting solutions by using the 30 meters high mass, which will be installed at the facilities that, that already has or will have solar mini, mini grids. Um, and um, we've, we've also considered the lighting analysis and the st we standardize the design for this uh, lighting solution. So in the future, if we need to construct um, uh, a lighting uh, pole um, at an X facility that does not have access to power, we already have a standard design for, uh, this, for the lighting units and for the uh, mini grid uh, in order to implement immediately and also lower the stress on the uh, technical resources available at the UNSCR staff office in Kakuma. Um, so as you can see, these are the technical details that we've prepared and the analysis and the studies, not only this, but also in order to communicate the, uh, uh, the final result or how the systems will look like in terms of area, in terms of space, in terms of uh, what should the beneficiaries expect from the solar projects? And they, everyone, of course, would like to see a visualization of how the project would look like. So we've done some 3D designs for some of the facilities, of course, not all of them, mainly the bigger or the larger facilities. And I will share some sizes with you uh, during my presentation. In addition to this, a very important uh, activity that we've carried out is the uh, listing down and uh, um, and measuring and plotting all the um, uh, work requirements, either the one that we will that we've already tendered and we're expecting from the contractors to deliver, or even the current state or status of the facilities in terms of electrical 
um, infrastructure. So this is one of the schools. This is Angelina Julie boarding school. Here to this, uh, this, to this side, you can see the kitchen area, the dining area. I believe this is, uh, uh, this is the kitchen area and then the dining area. And also here we have the dorms and these are the classes. So we've done all the electrical connections with the support, of course, with our partners uh, and sometimes three parties in order to, uh, um, to have detailed planning for all the activity that will be carried out in terms of the, uh, the sizes of, of the cables, the, the, uh, the cable runs, uh, also the, the locations for the feeders, the locations for the consumer units, the sizing, the specification, of course, lighting specification, name of buildings and rooms. So this would ease the process, not only at the uh, development stage, but also at the implementation stage. Um, I'm saying this because we have all these projects that will be implemented all together. We're talking about around 50 uh, mini grids that will be constructed together that requires a high level of organization and follow-up and project management uh, that if not planned, will at the development stage, it would be more challenging to construct and also keep an eye on the construction uh, process. Here I will um, share more I'd say uh, details about our plans and what we've done and where this is going in terms of all the technical details and the plans that I, I presented. For Energy for Health as one of the priority areas, today we are at 10%, 100, uh, at 10 uh, uh, greening uh, um, um, in terms of our greening progress bar, as you can see in the, uh, in the left uh, upper corner. By mid-22, we're going to, going to achieve 85% the green electrification and by the end of 22 we're targeting the 100%. Nowadays we have a total of eight health facilities between the clinics and hospitals. Seven of them will be solarized by mid this year and one of them requires a solarization with a target by the end of, of the year. The smallest solar mini grid or the power plant for the health facilities is 25 kilowatt peak with a storage system with all, while all the storage, uh, uh, the solid technology that we've decided for these facilities and for these systems as lithium ion uh, batteries. Also, the diesel generators will remain installed at the health facilities for backup and emergency purposes. Also, when uh, we require um, uh, maintenance activities for the solar power system, to the left lower corner, you see the number of, of facilities in terms of uh, uh, 2021, mid next year, and by the end of 2022. Also for the avoided CO2 emissions or uh, um, the, the, um, the eliminated also CO2 emissions, given the fact that these facilities are running on diesel generators, we expect to avoid a total of 279,000 uh, a kilogram of CO2 equivalent per year by uh, the solar systems, of course. And then for uh, for the health facilities also, um, it's very important, and not only for the facilities, for all the projects and for all the facilities that we are solarizing, it's very important to highlight that the development and the sustainability of the sector requires uh, the engagement of all uh, uh, partners, humanitarian and development agencies, in addition to the appreciation and concentration of the key role of the private sector companies, which will of course uh, bring uh, uh, to us, to the, the host and refugee community, they will bring the know-how and achieve technology transfer to such fragile communities and rural communities at the same time. Um, Considering this, we've considered um, training, extensive trainings for refugee and host community members. For the uh, health facilities, we are targeting a total of 28 female and male members. Uh, but this is a part of the bigger uh, uh, picture of the, of the uh, technology transfer and know-how transfer which is the target to achieve 125 renewable energy technicians by mid 2022 and this would be possible by uh, uh, ensuring that all these projects will have uh, trainees participating in the construction stage also have hands 
which is hands-on experience and also have access to um, theoretical uh, trainings. Uh, all systems as well uh, will receive two years operation and maintenance services. And for uh, this was one of the challenges that we, we, fa we faced in the past that most of the systems installed in Kakuma, they don't receive operation and maintenance uh, service. Uh, and of course, it's clear to everyone that uh, all of these, these systems are requires minimum operation and maintenance in addition to the cleaning, of course, but they are still not maintenance-free facilities. Therefore, the operation and maintenance uh, is essential to make sure that all these facilities are sustainable and can run properly uh, for 25 years or to 30 years based on the, on the lifetime of the components where the, uh, for the storage, of course, it's 10 to 12 years. In addition to this, we consider the live online monitoring feature for all the systems. Um, same for education, but the difference is uh, the number of facilities. Today, we are at 13%, 13% uh, of the facilities achieve the 100% uh, green electrification, but uh, uh, our target is to achieve the 100% by mid next year uh, through the, the, the implementation of the project that I mentioned. Also, for um, uh, in terms of um, um, uh, training or uh, um, um, the number of of, um, uh, of beneficiaries or house committee members who will uh, participate in trainings and achieve uh, um, capacity uh, better capacities in the area of energy. Here we are tar targeting a total of 62 uh, female and male members from both host and refugee communities. Uh, going back to the previous slide, the avoided CO2 emissions is around 365,000 kg uh, of CO2 equivalent. And in terms of sizes, uh, the smallest size is 15 kilowatt peak and the largest is a 25 kilowatt peak system. And the sizes were considered, of course, based on the energy auditing activities, based on uh, our uh, sizing uh, considerations in addition to the future expansion plans uh, available to us at the uh, development stage. Then energy for protection and security, which is, um, I put this slide here as one of the, of course, main interventions in terms of uh, uh, the energy uh, sector, um, but we try to, to benefit the most out of the available uh, solar power systems uh, to, to make sure that the harnessed energy from the sun could be utilized for the benefit of the community itself, not only through education and health services, uh, only, but also uh, through lighting uh, um, uh, up the neighborhood that surrounds the facilities that will receive uh, uh, solar systems. So here we're talking about uh, the mass. We are a bit over time, so if you could wrap up in a few minutes, that would be great. Sure, thank you. So for the energy for protection and security, we, we've considered the number, uh, a number of, uh, uh, of high masts for the facility that will have access to solar. And the design will be standard for both the lighting units and the mini grids design that will put, uh, provide electricity to the uh, uh, lighting fixtures. Then greening the operation really quick. Today, we, we are at 0% uh, greening target. And the 100% green electrification will be achieved by mid next year. Uh, number of facilities as six, UNCR field posts and reception centers, and the uh, avoided CO2 emissions is around 118,000 kg CO2 equivalent per year. Again, job opportunities, the same as I mentioned before, with, difference, uh, uh, with differences in number based on the project size uh, uh, mainly. Um, last but not least is the UNCR compound that I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation. We're targeting 80% greening electrification. The reason behind this is both uh, regulat re regulatory issues, um, technical viabilities, and also, of course, the financial argument or the financial feasibilities of, of going 100% or going 20%, uh, sorry, 80%. Um, for the avoided CO2 emissions, we're talking about 917 kg, uh, kilogram of CO2 equivalent, and we're expecting more than 25% of savings uh, uh, in, in our energy 
uh, built. And this project is, is developed based on a power purchase agreement uh, or a lease agreement, not a power purchase agreement with an independent power producer. So this is uh, this is my presentation and part my participation. Sorry, this was I was very fast during the uh, uh, the presentation. But of course, if you have any questions, I will be more than happy to answer them during the Q A session. Over back to you. Thank you so much. And as we switch back to our screen, I would encourage all our web presenters to switch on your camera so that our audience can see you and we can then jump directly into the Q&A session. And without further ado, um, maybe I will start with the first questions. And this is question is addressed to both Bettina and Mustafa. So um, Bettina, maybe you can go first and then followed by Mustafa. So in both of your presentation, we talked about two years of ONM, the operation maintenance of the facilities. So the question is, what kind of mechanism will you put in place to ensure that even after two years, the facilities are, are maintained and there is no mismanagement? So Bettina, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much for this question. So the two years was our buy-in period that we thought we needed until the operational maintenance pilot is up and running. So where the health unit teams have, you know, we, in the meantime, we secured the bylaws so that they actually are allowed to run an income generating. We need to still figure out with them and finalize on the actual um, intervention that they're going to do. And then also the whole issue, as you also say, not misuse and everything. So the, the whole bank account uh, question also comes in. So we said, if we have a two years contract with the contractor, that should help us. And then who knows, maybe they will keep that particular contractor um, because they have had the experience with them and uh, but are able to pay for the service themselves. Secondly, the whole new discussion that we are having with maybe UNHCR going forward where they were, where we are considering, you know, green boxes to measure what are the energy needs in the uh, social institutions and how maybe a bigger contract for a company would also make sense uh, in the overall response. So that's my answer here for Uganda, thank you. Thank you. And over to you, Mustafa. Well, thank you. Actually, I didn't have much to add on this, but I have maybe one, one comment here. The, the, the initial idea of uh, uh, having a pool of technicians in, in Kakuma is to make sure that the local community has access to the technical know-how and they can provide services related to the energy sector and mainly the, the solar PV uh, uh, systems. And for the first two years, we will, of course, have a contract agreement, an agreement with the uh, contractor. But after two years, UNCR will have to move to a frame agreement to make sure that the, uh, all, the, all, the, all the facilities have access to proper and systematic uh, operation and maintenance services. So here we see there is a livelihood component to the host and refugee communities at, uh, at a fragile area like Kakuma. If we successfully developed the technical capacities of the uh, of the refugees and the, the host community members, then these technicians and energy, uh, uh, I'd say, uh, uh, experts after a few years, they will be able to establish companies and provide direct services to these facilities, either through UNSCR or uh, directly to the implementing partners or the manager for, for the facilities. So I believe it's very important to make sure that the, the, the technology transfer is being uh, uh, handled in, uh, carefully. So we make sure in the future, the host and refugee communities can make livelihood out of uh, such services. Uh, maybe a direct follow-up question to that statement would be, uh, does that mean that the asylum policy of Kenya allows refugees to work? Uh, because you did mention about uh, powering jobs uh, in your slide. Well, actually, we have um, our, our colleagues in the uh, solutions department and the livelihood department, um, um, they, they can answer this better. But um, recently, uh, the refugees have filed their tax revenues to the government. And this shows that, of course, the refugees can create uh, businesses or open businesses and also 
report uh, their tax and revenues to the to the government. So short, long answer short, I would say yes. But of course, the details would be answered by uh, uh, our experts from from the field. Thank you so much, Mustafa. Uh, moving to you, Sina. Um, you talked about um, mafia generators in Beirut. So if you could explain a little bit on that, what is their role and what exactly, how is they influencing the energy sector? Thank you for that question. Um, so um, there is a quite a clientelistic system uh, pertaining to all of the service provision uh, in Beirut. So the cost of reliance is, is so great on, on alternative systems than the public systems, you would have different uh, uh, people and actors uh, capitalizing on that. Uh, so in uh, the energy sector, you have this, as I said, larger neighborhood generators, but they are operated uh, usually by, by somewhat um, power brokers in the local community that has also connections to the municipalities and, and often sometimes links to whoever kind of holds the power in those communities. So that means that if uh, you are, of course, uh, you have options as to who you go to to get additional services, but in, in a sense and in practice, you are fairly kind of forced to go to the, whoever holds that kind of power to provide the services in that specific community. Meaning that if we talk about alternative energy solutions at the community level, at scale, and, and considering that some of these neighborhoods are perhaps between five to 20,000 inhabitants, so to provide uh, individual household solutions would not make sense in terms of, of the cost it would take uh, to provide such services. So looking at the, the kind of systems at, at the, the neighborhood level means that you somehow need to, to consider is there options to involve these informal actors uh, that are already players in the energy market. Uh, and of course there is little evidence that this could be done but but uh, the way we're working is is really to kind of identify who are the players setting up an alternative system outside might not work if these these uh, mafia and, and kind of informal brokers have so so much power to control the the alternative energy uh, provision thank you so much sina um now moving to over to you bettina a very interesting question popped up so you mentioned about the income generating aspect of the mini grids. So the question is, how do you ensure that the priority is given to health appliances and only excess energy then goes out for the income generating activities? Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, it's in a way a bit simple because we are going to use load limiters so that uh, for this particular little place, it's not going to be huge, uh, most likely in the, in the um, jargon of Uganda, we call it canteens. It's a bit like a kiosk-like thing, and we think that they will be. Uh, I mean, some of them opted to do maybe phone charging for outpatients uh, and sale of drinks and and maybe sanitary materials or hygiene materials, stuff like that. So it it probably doesn't need a lot of energy, and load limiters is what we're planning to use. Thanks. Thank you. I know we are just about time, but there is one final question for you, Mustafa. So maybe you could quickly answer that. So you talked about a lot of um, the greening activities within UNHCR. Uh, could you share a bit more also about the business model? Like who is going to pay for these activities? Is the ownership going to be passed back to the schools? How does the business model look like? Well, thank you, Anisha. This is a very important question. Um, and in my presentation, I just briefly mentioned the the model of uh, of some of the projects but for for the education facilities health facilities and the unsr field posts and reception centers they will be there are and have been developed based on epc contracts so now we've we've tendered these projects some of them are under construction other others will, will start construction very soon but once the tender is out and awarded, it will be an EPC agreement where the contractor, the private sector company will do the engineering, procurement and construction 
then the operation and maintenance service will be provided for two years, but the owner of the asset will be UNSCR. And of course, uh, uh, we would we might need to consider handing over the facility to the uh, uh, in, to the partners uh, once the uh, the partner is ready to take over such uh, uh, um, such an asset that requires technical uh, uh, services. And then we have the UNSCR. Uh, compound, which is one of the largest facilities in uh, in, in Kakuma. Um, for for the compound, we have we're expecting a one megawatt peak, fewer or uh, uh, smaller than one megawatt peak. I would say a 90 kilowatt peak system with storage and 20 percent would be provided from diesel generators. But for this one, what it was developed based on innovative fi finance financial uh, uh, method, uh, which is a lease agreement where the independent power producer will come to Kakuma sign an agreement with the sub office and we will be paying for the clean electricity that's received from the uh, from the IPP. So these are the two business models that we have at the moment. Uh, and and um, they've been, we tested mainly that the EPC contract, they are successful. And now it's time to, to, to discuss the IP or to, to test the IPP model and to see uh, how, how it goes. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much to all the presenters for your excellent presentations and answering all the questions. And a huge thank you to our audience for staying with us till the end, although we have a few minutes delays. Apologies on that. Uh, with that, uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, if you want to send us any feedback, please do send it as in this address given uh, on the screen. We will share the webinar documentation in a follow up email with you tomorrow afternoon. So with that, I thank you again for your time. I wish you a good day, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you are logging today from, and hope we will see you again in future, because we will be back with our new webinar series, a continuation of this one in January. So we hope to see you again in January, and thank you once again. I, I wish you a good day, and bye-bye.